Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanchman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And lately, I've been playing around with a couple of things. One is a computer language for music called Super Collider. And the other is exploring the architecture of the Buchla 700. So the Buchla 700 was one of Don Buchla's instruments that, like most of his instruments, was fairly ahead of its time and pretty far out there and really pushed the available technology of the time to the limit. So it was very expensive and wasn't really particularly ever finished, but it's absolutely fascinating. A few years ago, Lynx Crow, who worked with Don on many systems for many years, kindly provided me the source code and gave me permission to post that. And there are a few interesting projects to come out of that. One is there is a group that's managed to get the main code for the interface to build and run in an emulator that they wrote, including the rather strange video chip and all of that. So you can actually download this, boot the code, <laughs> run it, Unfortunately, there's no sound generation because the source code, well, you can sort of put together some clues as to how the actual sound generation works, but mostly it's the front-end interface stuff. There was an effort to try to sort through this in a bit more detail. It's documented on this website called Buchla 700 Archaeology. Uh, where Johan Boberg, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, sorry if I'm not, managed to sort through the code and figure out what the various configurations were in terms of the way the oscillators in the Buchla 700 can be put together. This is something that Yamaha called algorithms in their DX series of synthesizers. So with this, there's been some additional effort to actually make sound generating things. Jonathan Schatz, who's worked with Don for several years on the 200E system, it looks like he's working on a software plugin. Uh, not sure what the platforms are for this. You could go to his website and look at it in more detail. It's not released yet, but he's trying to make a version of the Buchla 700 with a slicker, more modern interface. You can tell if you go run the original interface, it's feels clunky from a modern perspective. And I've been looking lately at Super Collider, and I didn't want to have to wait for any of these other efforts to figure out what these configurations sound like. So I thought this would be a good reason to be learning Super Collider. Now, this is not slick in any particular fashion. It's fairly rough still. At some point, I'll take this source code and dump it on the web and people can download it and experiment with it. In the meantime, I want to spend a little more time refining it. But for my students in my retrofuturistic hardware vertically integrated project team, I wanted to give them a sense of both what the Buchla 700 is like and also give them a bit of an introduction to Super Collider and share my experiences working with Super Colliders because several of those students are trying to learn Super Collider. I'm just going to go through this somewhat unplanned, and by somewhat unplanned, I mean completely unplanned, talking a little bit about what the code does and talking about the things I've discovered in Super Collider along the way, particularly things that are fairly complicated to figure out the first or even sometimes the 30th time you've run into them. So to set up the GUI for my little Buchla 700-ish sort of thing, I'm going to take this file I've created here and I'm going to evaluate it. Now in the stock Super Collider, you won't get this particular keyboard shortcut I've created, but you can make your own keyboard shortcuts like I did by going to shortcuts and somewhere down here, let's see, where is that at? Ah, here we go. Evaluate file. I set it to be shift cloverleaf one. Again, that's not built into stock. So I could go up to the menu and just say that, or I can use my shortcut and it sets everything up and creates the menu. So 
I created this set of buttons down here so you can still make noise with it even if you don't have a MIDI controller hooked up, but I also have my MIDI controller hooked up, which will activate it. I have a very primitive preset mechanism. Here's an initial, just create a side wave. Here's a four operator electric piano. Nothing too fancy. My attempt at that famous Lately bass. Random things. Anyway, so right now the patch setup is not very sophisticated. I basically have a file with a bunch of functions that will set appropriate variables that you have to edit manually. I currently don't have any save capability. The basic configuration of the Buchla 700 is that there are four oscillators. Yamaha would call these operators. Yamaha would also tie each of its oscillators with a particular envelope. Uh, well, really just basically some sort of scaling factor on the output of the oscillator that could be determined by an envelope. I think some kind of LFOs, maybe various sort of modifiers with various performance controls. I don't recall the exact details. Anyway, the most famous of these, the DX7, had six oscillators. Again, Yamaha called those operators. Later, things like the DX11 and DX100 and TX81Z had four oscillators. Some of those just had sine wave oscillators, like in the original DX7 and I think DX5 and DX1. And the later ones, or, or at least some of the others, I can't remember the exact sequence they came out in, gave you the option of choosing some other waveforms. Now, I have a bunch of configurations here. So there's 12 of them. And the only reason I was able to figure this out is that somebody was able to deduce what these were from the source code. So the various circles represent oscillators. And while Yamaha included the amplitude of the output of each oscillator as just part of the quote unquote operator. Here, those kinds of amplitude changes are indicated separately by these peak triangles that represent indices. And the way it works here is that you can follow the path of modulation by following the direction of the triangles. So for here, for instance, in configuration one, we have oscillator one, it's being frequency modulated by oscillator two, and index one here controls the amount of modulation. Similarly, down here, we have oscillator two that's modulating oscillator one with an amount controlled by index two. Oscillator two itself is being frequency modulated by the sum of oscillators three and four, their outputs, but their outputs are being controlled by indices four and five. Now, you'll see a few th other things that you won't see on a Yamaha-style diagram. You'll see that there's a couple of these triangles that come out of whatever the final oscillators are. So here, one is the final oscillator that's going to wave shaper A, three is the final oscillator that's going to wave shaper B, and in any case, these are being controlled by indices three or six. Now, what's going on with those wave shapers is that those are basically functions that take an input sample value and give you an output sample value. So if these are just diagonal lines like we have here, then the output matches the input. What I'm showing over here on the right is the result of just taking a unit amplitude sine wave and putting it through this function. So if you have this nice diagonal line, you get this nice little sine wave out. But you don't want to think of it like this being a table that's just being scanned with samples being shoved out the way you would in something like 
one of the Wave PPG 2.2, 2.3, or microwave kind of instruments. Here, or for that matter, in something like the Profit VS. Here, this is a transfer function. So I can play around with some of the other ones I've picked here. Let me pick the one that I call True Square. So in this example, if you put a unit amplitude sine wave in, you will get a square wave out. And this is the transfer function that implements that. I'll show you a little later about how I'm actually defining those. So I have a bunch of these that are preset in here, and it's easy to add more. Right now, I don't have anything that lets me actually graphically move a slider up and down to change, uh, change points in this table or change the... Or change the Shebyshev coefficients that I'll show you later. Let's go to the initial patch here to illustrate that idea. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn down index B all the way, sorry, index 6 all the way. So this is a sine wave going through. Now let me put this on the square wave function. And now I'm going to take. For wave shaper A, I also have a wave shaper B that I could pick here something I'm called alternative saw. We'll play with that in a second. Aha! So what's going on here? This index three controls the volume of a sine wave coming out of oscillator one. I don't have any modulation going on. So it's an FM-ish kind of sound, but it's not FM. This is just your input wave is intersecting with more and more of this transfer function as I increase the volume. So at rather small volumes, small amplitudes going into the wave shaper. We're probably in this part of the table, so we're not getting a lot of harmonics. But as I get more of the wave shaper, so I can turn that down here. Let me try it with index six into this, what I call the saw shaper. So that's buzzier. Here's both of them. I created this little circle here knob controller that lets you crossfade between them. I have it default to sort of set in the center here. So over here you can hear a very big buzzy sound, characteristic of a sawtooth, and this is a square wave. Now notice this doesn't actually look anything like a sawtooth wave. I can't actually set things in this table the way I have it set up here to get a sawtooth out. So. We have this weird looking wave shape here, but interestingly, although the phases are not the same as that of a natural sawtooth, it sounds like a natural sawtooth because the magnitudes of the Fourier series coefficients, should have clarified earlier, the, I meant the phases of the Fourier series coefficients are different. The magnitudes are the same. Similarly, I have this thing I created called, uh, did I have two, ah, triangle compatible square. So actually, let me do that on this one. So I've got the, I'll have the regular square up here, the true square. Here I have what I call the triangle. Notice these are very different waveforms here. As I'm crossfading between the outputs here, there's a slight difference of volume because I've set this up so that everything winds up being normalized and these wind up normalized to different levels. So here I have this weird little shape that has these kind of, I'm not sure what you'd want to call this. Is this a wine glass? I don't know. Use your imagination, whatever you want to call it. And again, those are both square wave kinds of sounds. They have the same Fourier magnitudes, but they have different Fourier phases. I'm going to, to actually, no, I haven't said, ah, mm, let me think for a second. Okay. I was about to try something, but it would get overly complicated. The reason I call this triangle compatible is it has the sort of similar um, Fourier series 
phases. Uh, mm, sorry, as the uh, as the triangle wave. So it turns out if you actually want to morph between a triangle wave sound and a square wave sound, I discovered that this sort of gives you a smooth fading between all of the various Fourier series coefficients. If you use a true wave, if you use a true square wave, this thing has core. Fourier series coefficients that alternate sine compared to what the triangle wave does. And as a result, you get some weird cancellations when you cross fade between them. So that was just something I discovered for this particular project. Anyway, let me look at this true square wave again. No, uh, I meant to say, ah, the triangle compatible square. Notice these have very different effects as I increase the volume going into the wave shaper. Again, that sounds like FM, but it's not FM. Now let's listen to what it's like for this, what I call triangle compatible. Notice it's almost completely quiet until I hit the end here. That's because it's almost completely quiet and then it suddenly shoots up at the end here when we look at that transfer function. So until the sine wave hits the point that it's really getting to the end here, um, you're not really getting very much out. Let me set these both back to the default just straight line transfer function and show you the FM for a bit. So in this particular case, Let me take the index here, and I'm going to increase index 1 here, so oscillator 2 will now modulate oscillator 1. Fairly typical FM kind of sound. I can also do these strange timbre modulation things. I'll come back to what timbre modulation is later. Timbre, timbre modulation on the 700 is indicated by these little inputs into the sides of the triangles. So you only get that in these configurations just before you hit the wave shaper. And not every configuration has it. Let's see, configuration 0, 1, 3, and 8. 10 and 11, but configurations 2, 4, 6, let's see, 9 don't have timbre modulation. I'm going to come back to that timbre modulation later. Right now, let me just show you how interesting it is to do FM modulation with one of these wavetables going on. So here, let me play a C. So that's frequency modulation going in. Let me pull out this thing that I call alt sign flipping. So again, this is what you get if you put a unit amplitude sine wave into it which is this. But only if I'm putting a unit amplitude sine wave in, which is when this is all the way at the top. If it's a lower amplitude sine wave, I'm hitting smaller parts of the table and getting other things. Now, what happens if I frequency modulate the sine wave going in? All sorts of weirdness. I think there's some aliasing going on there, probably. So now let me turn it down a little bit so we're not hitting all of it. Let's try something else. How about, I call this full tone wheel. So this is basically the harmonics corresponding to the draw bars on a Hammond organ. Fairly well-known sound.
But notice, I only get that if I have this all the way up. And as I change the amplitude going in, we're hitting different parts of this transfer function, getting different harmonics. Again, let's now FM modulate that. So here I've got some amount of FM modulation, but now I'm changing the amplitude going into the table. What I call Jimmy Smith here is just the first three of those harmonics. I think that was his famous setting. I can change the frequency ratios of various things. So here if I want to have a ratio of a half of the modulating, this should uh, drop the sound by an octave. Now let me flip that so we have the modulator an octave up. If I want to just move everything here up an octave, I can do this. As an aside, this configuration one is basically two Buchla 400 voices in parallel. You would probably not be shocked to know the Buchla 400 was a instrument that came out before the 700, one of Don's earlier instruments, and like the 700 was way crazy and awesome and amazing and way ahead of its time and way expensive. Anyway, I've played around with making a few patches for this. This is the this is my attempt to create that famous phased gong sound that starts the Michael Jackson song Beat It. That's from the Sinclair, and this is me trying to get something that sounded like what's on the Sinclair, but largely failing. But it's fun anyway. Notice I have all of these levels down here in this patch. The only one where I have these higher is the initial patch to avoid some confusion. On the 700, these would be considered performance controls mapped to the front panel for experimenting. Here I'm actually driving all these various parameters using the various envelope commands that are available in Super Collider. So I didn't set up a bunch of individual boxes or knobs for an attack or decay or whatever. The uh, Buchla 700, like pretty much all of Don's instruments, has extremely flexible envelopes. And by using this trick of being able to just put code right in here and being able to evaluate that code on the fly, we then get the rich variety of possible envelopes that Super Collider has built in, where you can also create your own and do other tricks that I'll show you a little later. This is my attempt to do that famous electric piano patch, famous bass sound, weird things. One thing I want to note is that the way I set this up is you can change the configuration while a note is being played. So for this particular patch, zero and one aren't very different. Or two for that matter. Ah, three is very different. There's four. Haha, <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, there's, there's an, uh, let me do this again. There's a little attack part of the sound. There you can hear the attack. So like with the DX7, you could take a set of parameters and get all sorts of different stuff just by changing the configuration. Again, Yamaha would call these algorithms. All right. So that phase gong, let's play around with that a little bit more. That's fun. Here's the impulse train. My alt saw. Ah, 
Ah, I could do that all day, but I won't. Anyway, that's kind of fun. So, what's behind this? So, this is not in any way a tutorial on everything about Super Collider, and it's not going to be a real in-depth description of this code. I'm just going to point out a few things. To learn more about Super Collider, you definitely want to check out the YouTube channel of Eli Fieldsteel, who's a professor. And he, in addition to having his various classes online, looks like these are his live streams to his university students, he also has a series of particularly dedicated tutorials for this, that, and the other. And they are really, really amazing. So I strongly recommend that you go through his tutorials systematically. Hey Welcome to tutorial. Start with number one, and then go to number two, and then go to number three. I've done it. You want to do it too. Anyway, so let's take a look at the code here. Now, I'm not going to in any way try to get you to believe that the code I'm writing is any good. And in particular, follows any particular super collider best practices or conventions. This is me hacking stuff together to get stuff going. Okay, so notice when I initially ran this, I said evaluate file. Okay, and that creates the GUI and everything. Typically, people using Super Collider don't do that. They tend to want to evaluate little blocks of code. So for instance, I might just say, what if I want to know what 3 plus 4 is? I would evaluate this line. So I could evaluate this selection or line, or I could do this with a few things. I could say, declare a variable a equals 3, and then I'll say, what's a plus 5? I need to put a semicolon after here. So I'm going to use shift enter, and that gives me eight. Notice I had to use a var here to declare that variable. And it's scoped within this block that I'm evaluating. Now you have to be careful with that because this will work in ways that you do not expect. Actually, I wonder if that only works because this is a global variable. Oh, nope, that still worked. Okay, that worked, yay. So anyway, that is evaluate a chunk of code. And notice that I evaluated it over here and the answer appeals over here. If you're used to working with Python or MATLAB or some other language with a REPL, a read eval print loop, you're used to typing things in and seeing the answer appear in the same window. This is more of a small talk style. I'll talk about small talk a little bit later, where you've got, you know, you could just open up some file and type stuff and evaluate it like this. In small talk, the answer would usually appear right after where you evaluated something in that workspace. So if I did three plus four, instead of the seven appearing over here, it would appear in your little workspace. But we have this separate thing called the post window. Now in stock Super Collider, when you open it up, your editor window and your post window are combined. At some point, I separated my post window, and I've not figured out how to hook it back up with the main window. There's something really obvious I'm overlooking. So if you know how to do that, let me know. Anyway, this is where your answers show up and error messages show up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's evaluate a little chunk, and that's shift return. You want to get that a lot. The other thing you want to be able to do is to evaluate a selection line or region. So what's a region? So this is something that's a little weird and is specific to Super Collider as far as I know. You can take a chunk of code and you can separate it, sorry, you can surround it with parentheses and now I can evaluate this region. That would define a region. And here that's cloverleaf return on the Mac. I'm it's probably some equivalent thing or the other on Windows and Linux or whatever. So here, this booted up the server. I'll talk about that in a second. It gave us an oscilloscope and a frequency analyzer. That's kind of fun. All right. Anyway, it only evaluated that chunk of code. So usually when I'm working, because I'm used to evaluating chunks of code, I'll actually surround this whole thing in parentheses 
to make this whole Athena region. So now when I do that Cloverleaf Enter, it evaluates everything. <laughs> That's kind of fun. Anyway, it's evaluating that whole chunk of code. And I want to mention that specifically because if you look at the demo files, there are things like this acid underscore, however you pronounce that, that want to be evaluated as a file. But most of the examples actually have these little region code blocks. And if you evaluate the file as a whole, you get an error. And what they want you to do is to go in and find individual blocks and evaluate those to demonstrate different things. Anyway, I can now do this whole thing. All right. So you want to get used to hitting Shift Enter or Cloverleaf Enter or whatever the equivalent on Windows is. Okay, so I make extensive use on global variables. I know that's bad programming practice, but whatever. A global variable in Super Collider is defined by having a tilde in front, and in the editor they show up in this, I guess that's orange, question mark. Anyway, here I'm defining a bunch of colors, red, green, blue, alpha, and I've picked these to match the colors in the diagram here, and you'll see I've used those on various sliders, and I plan to keep trying to have some sort of visual language like that. Here I define a bunch of strings. Notice strings are in these double quotes, and those are the str strings, <laughs> sorry, strings of the various sliders here. A uh, bit of warning, I'm not going to have a lot of time, basically no time to edit it, so I'm not going to do a lot of editing, basically no editing. Hopefully this will still be fun and vaguely coherent. Notice I'm also defining a array here by using the brackets, using the commas to indicate the different elements in the array. Here I'm defining an array of the colors of the sliders. So the first six I want to use my pink. This little explanation mark six is sort of a replication operation. So this says, take this triangle pink and make an array out of it. That's those, that triangle pink six times in a row. Here I've got individual arrays with just one element for the orange and the green. Here I'm replicating black. Black's built in, so I don't have to define that as a separate color. That's just color.black. Oh, and the syntax highlighting in the editor is nice, and the autocompletion is nice. So if I do color dot, ooh, look at all this stuff that shows up. So that's, that's nice. Very convenient. Notice that plus plus here is combining arrays. Notice I am putting the colons here as a end of statement. Really, what these are is they're separators. If you have a block of code, you can often leave that off. So for instance, I could do that var a equals three, a plus three, whoop, a plus three, I can evaluate this line and it still works even though this doesn't have a semicolon at the end. Now, but if I tried to run the whole thing without say the semicolon here, then it will then it will complain at me. So there's a bunch of stuff here that I define to use later. I've got this separate file of patches that I've currently hard coded. Let me pull that up. And what that file is, notice it does have um, this block structure here, right? So I can evaluate it. I set this up as a uh, separate file. And essentially what this does is it creates a set of, it creates a couple of arrays, one called instruments and one's called instrument names. As you might guess, the instrument names are things like Lately Bass, 80s Electric, Piano, and Phase Gong. And the instruments themselves are functions. Now, functions in Super Collider are first class objects. And Super Collider is very heavily object oriented, even though you won't see me in this code demo write any particular classes. Everything's an object. It's very hardcore about that. And it's following the matter of small talk that Super Collider looks to me like it's very heavily based on small talk. Small talk is a fascinating language created by Alan Kay, Dan Ingalls, and Adele Goldberg and their colleagues at Xerox Park. And it was created as 
really part of a whole way of thinking about computing that involved a machine called the Xerox Alto, fascinating computer. And Smalltalk isn't really so much a language as a language combined with a IDE, combined with an operating system. And really, even that description doesn't do it justice. Smalltalk's really a whole different conceptualization of how you should use a computer that's fairly different than what we do now. Although you can see the influence of small talk in a lot of things, including the very GUIs that you're using today. Anyway, so here I'm using this add method to add these instruments in series. Um, notice I'm not doing just instruments.add, I'm doing instrument names like equals instrument names.add. I find if I don't do that, this doesn't always work the way I expect. There's a lot about Super Collider I haven't bothered to understand yet or have tried to understand and still don't quite understand. Anyway, notice that I'm adding things. And what am I adding? I'm adding functions. But notice you don't see the word function anywhere. So now we're getting to something that is incredibly confusing in using Super Collider, which is although the semantics of Super Collider are a lot like Smalltalk, the syntax superficially looks like Java or JavaScript or C++ or C or C Sharp or any number of these quote unquote curly brace languages, but it uses these things very differently. So in something like C, you know, you would say void my function, you give it some parameters, and this would define a piece of code for that function, and then you would say if a equals b, b, then you might do some stuff. Here's some stuff you might do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in, in most of the languages you're used to using, these open and closed curly braces are just indicating blocks of code for something like an if-then-else statement. In Super Collider, this defines a function. You can't just use this willy-nilly. So we could define a function like dude equals Actually, uh, I'm declaring a variable here in this code, little code chunk I'm about to evaluate. So what does it equal? It equals a function. So you can create functions without any, without any name to them. Here I'm creating a function and I'm naming it. So when we say functions here are first class objects, it means you can create functions, assign them to variables. You can pass them to methods. You can return them from methods, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can return functions from other functions. So I'm going to define a function of one argument, let's call it a, and we'll return a plus three. Okay, so that defines a function. Now, you might say, can I do something like this? Let's find out. So I'm going to use shift return to try to evaluate this, and it complains. Now, what dude really is, it's a function, but it's an object. It takes methods. It wants to be given the value method. And here I'm going to give it the parameter 5 to pass in here. Let's see if this works. There, there it goes. So this, this thing of path, passing in a value method, that's very close to Smalltalk. Now in Smalltalk, Smalltalk defines these functions, and Smalltalk actually calls these blocks using this kind of notation here with the brackets, and you do something like this. You would say, here's my variable. Notice it's putting the variable in between these vertical bars here, and you can put several of these. So you'd say something like this, and you might say a plus three. And then in Smalltalk, the way you would pass parameters to a function to evaluate it is you would actually pass it this value method. And in Smalltalk, you would use a, a colon here, and you would pass it in like that. Now. Because of that influence, influence of small talk, you can actually use that notation instead of declaring the argument here like that. I can put that A in between these vertical bars, and it does the same thing. So I found that older super collider examples will tend to use this small talk kind of syntax with the vertical bars. I find that newer examples tend to use this arg syntax. So I guess it's a matter of style. Maybe they went to the syntax because people found the vertical bars too scary or something. Anyway, so I'm defining the instruments as a bunch of functions. 
So later I can evaluate those functions and run this big set of ugly code that basically just sets various global variables that I even double emphasize to myself by putting G here because inside of various routines, I use config without the G. So I wanted to make that distinction. So this business of this index three Eno, level A Eno, that harkens back to this set of uh, variables, global variables I've defined here that are coding. Basically, I wanted to be able to set up a big set of envelopes and treat them all as one big array of envelopes than having a bunch of individual pieces of code to handle the filter and the resonance different from the indices or whatever. It's a little kludgy. The one thing that's a little unsatisfying here is notice before I start actually putting in those envelopes, I actually have to create that array and I have to create it of the right size. So that's part of the code. So if you're just wanting to set up a new patch by changing the code here, so you can just copy this bit and say paste here and now I've made a new patch. Here's experiment three uh, where maybe I've changed some of these. So now if I reevaluate this piece of code, so I'm going to evaluate the whole thing here. Now I should have, oh, I forgot. This is only really set up, the, the list of patches has to be set up with the main routine. So let me, now that I've changed the set of patches, let me evaluate everything. There and now my experiment three is here. All right. So notice that I was able to take that piece of code indicated in this file. I've got a string and one of the methods that string takes is dot load. And so it loads in that file and executes it. Notice if, I think it wants this to really be a block. Like, let's see if this still works if I take out the parentheses at the beginning and end like this. So the last thing we did was to say, okay, the last thing that I get evaluated made a bunch of buttons. Let's see what happens if I do this. Uh, oh, it's, whoop, sorry, not the patches. I want to evaluate this whole thing. Um, it looked like, oh, it looks like it was happy with that. So whether I have these in here or not, these parentheses at the start or not, it looked like it was happy. To double check that, let me add an experiment for. Okay. I do have an experiment for. Okay, so in that block of code that we're loading in, it doesn't need the parentheses on the fur outside. Unfortunately, you can't really this way of using parentheses to define a block that you evaluate, you can't nest those as far as I can tell. All right. Whew. That was a lot of stuff and we barely got into it. The next thing I do here is I have a global variable called current patch. Now, global variables and non-global variables act differently. If you ask about a global variable that you've never defined before, it will return nil. If you have some other variable and try to evaluate it, it will actually actively complain and then return nil. So nice thing about global variables is you can use them even if you haven't defined them. So this is a way that I check to see if the code's running for the first time or not. So if current patch is nil, then I set current patch to zero, which is my default patch. But notice if I have run it before, then I'm ke I keep the same patch even when I reevaluate this. So to try to fake that condition, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to temporarily say what is current patch. I'm going to set this to nil just as a line sitting here. Okay, so now as far as Super Collider is concerned, it hasn't run this piece of code before. So when it runs, it doesn't do what I'm expecting. Hmm, let me try that again patch equals nil. See, it's happy with that line. Okay, so now if I run this again, ah, not sure what I did wrong before. Anyway, notice it did load this initial patch, but now I can be working on a particular patch, go in and change the code, evaluate the whole thing, and it doesn't reset the patch back to zero on me. I'll talk a little bit later about how this if statement works. So here, notice I'm 
grabbing the function to create whatever patch I need to load in, set those various values. I'm grabbing it from the array, and then I'm evaluating that value command on it. Notice I don't have any parentheses here to pass in any parameters to that method because here I don't, I don't need any. All right, the next line here is where I create my little set of possible Chebyshev things to play around with. So what do I mean by my Chevy, Chevy things? So in the Bukla 700 and the Bukla 400, you could sort of arbitrarily, arbitrarily create these transfer functions, but you could also create the transfer functions yourself by using something called Chebyshev polynomials. And Chebyshev polynomials give you a way of creating one of these transfer functions where if you give it a unit uh, amplitude sinusoid, i.e. a sinusoid with the amplitude of one, you get a spectrum out where the magnitudes of that spectrum correspond to the various coefficients of the set of Chebyshev polynomials you're using. So that is a whole lot of complicated math. But what it means is that you can sort of get a handle on what kind of spectra you're going to get out. So if you want to learn more about that, you can look at the Chebyshev polynomials on Wikipedia and from every other sources. You can look up wave shaping synthesis, Google that and find all sorts of things. So here's an example of Chebyshev, sorry, Chebyshev polynomials at 625 in the morning. Why am I still awake? I'm creating this video because it's very exciting. All right, anyway. So the straight line you see here, notice that's what my default is. So here I say my Chebyshev, first Chebyshev polynomial should be one, and that's what gives me that straight line. And then what I'm doing in here is I'm actually creating lists of, creating an array really, of arrays containing Chebyshev coefficients. So for example, a triangle wave has only odd Fourier magnitudes, and those drop according to the square of the order of that Fourier series coefficient. And so that's what we're doing here. To create the square compatible triangle, uh, what did I call that? Oh, I do that a little differently. Oh, I should talk about array note. My God, there's so much to talk about here in Super Collider. All right. So, what does this do? This one dot dot 32 notation. So, this is a shorthand for something a little more complicated, a method call that will give you um, dot dot. Did it not like that? Let's see, do I have to put this in parentheses for that to work? Maybe I do. Ah, I have to put that in parentheses. Okay, here's parentheses. I put one dot dot 32. Unsurprisingly, it makes one to 32. Let's see, what if I do minus three to 32? Okay, it does, does minus three to 32 by integers. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is that creates an array. And here I can use the squared method on that. And instead of just squaring one value, it squares all of them. So I've got one, four, nine. And now I've got this division thing. So I can take, say, one divided by that. And this winds up doing what I want. But trust me, it would be a very good idea to get in the habit of putting parentheses around things like that. The reason I say that, and this is a huge gotcha in Super Collider, is there's not really a sense of operator precedence for binary operators. So if I do something like four plus three times five, what do you expect this to do? The prince would suggest we take three times five and multiply it by first and then add four. So that'll be 15 plus four, that works. Now watch what happens when I take the parentheses away. Bam, what's going on here? Well. It's doing what you might think of if you did this. 4 plus 3 is 7 times 5 is 35. So if I have this set of binary operations like this, this is really a shorthand for a series of method calls. 
And there's no built-in precedence uh, that says multiplication and division take precedence over addition and subtraction. So if you want this to happen first, you have to put some parentheses in here. This is a bug that bites me at least once every other day that I'm using Super Collider, even though I know it's there. So what saves us down here? Well, there is a bit of a precedence that one of these little dot method calls, that comes first. So if I do 3 squared plus 4 squared, it doesn't take 3 and then square it and then at, it knows that, let's see, what I want to say is that it knows that you want to do this 3 squared first and the 4 squared first and then add them. That works the way you expect. 9 plus 16 gives you 25. But if I did something else, you know, any number of things like 3, uh, three plus 2 times 4 like this, this will not operate the way you expect in most languages. Now, uh, another thing I can do here is I can do squared 4. This makes it look like you've got this function squared and you're calling 4. But internally, this is taking the object 4 that's a integer and it's running the squared method on it. So squared 4 really internally maps to 4 dot squared. Anyway, because that's a dot first, it will take that 4 first and then square it. Actually, let me do it something like this. So this does 2 dot, sorry, this will take 4 and then square it, which gives us 16. And then we multiply it by 2, which is what you expect. And actually, there wouldn't be any other way to parse that. Okay, so 3 plus 2 times 4 squared, right? This is taking 3, adding 2, giving you 5. And that 5 times 16 is what's giving you that 80. So if you want to do this to operate the way you expect, you really want to do something like this. All right. So let's do something like this. Let me write this notation again. Ah, this is the point I wanted to make. So if you do 2 times 4 dot squared here, okay, so this is taking 4 and it's squaring it, which gives us 16 times 2. So here it is doing that dot squared first. If you wanted to do 2 times 4 First, you would set up like this, which gives you 8, and then squaring it would give you 64. So, these dot method calls have precedence over the uh, these binary operation. And I don't need mean binary like 0, 1. I mean, there's two things to it. But, that's the only thing you get. It's not going to tell you that that squared here... Uh, sorry, it's not going to tell you that multiplication comes before plus or not. Similarly, if I chain these left to right, so let's do squared, is there a cubed? Let's see. So that's 4 squared is 16 and cubed works like that. Okay, so it's going left to right. And actually here, that would be the only thing that would make sense. So anyway, so by default, Generally, method evaluations happen going left to right. The dot notation will have precedence over binary operator notation, but that's it. <laughs> so, with that out of the way, let's talk about what happens with what happens with array notation and something like this. So, this one to thirty-two squared. Let me evaluate that separately. That gives me this array that's link 32. Notice I'm taking this array that's length 2 and dividing it like this. So that doesn't explode. And if you're used to using a language like MATLAB, you're used to this being unhappy because here I have an array of length 2, here I have an 
ray of length 32. And in something like MATLAB, well, actually in something like MATLAB, it would try to interpret this as some sort of uh, matrix division that's not element-wise. In MATLAB, to have an element-wise division, you would have to put a dot in front of here, and it would still complain at you because you've got this dimension mix match. So SuperCollider, it looks like, is also influenced by a very old language called APL that had this weird, funny character set and was pretty advanced for the time. And um, it sort of uh, was the first language I'm aware of that really let you do a lot of crazy matrix manipulations without having to write for loops yourself. Let's see if there's some examples in here. One bad thing about APL, though, is that it has its own crazy, insane character set. So if you think Perl is a read, sorry, Perl is a write once, read never language, um, APL is like that to the power of a Googleplex. It's got a lot of weird symbols in it that you have to remember what they like like what in the world is this um Ulf Grenander uh applied mathematician at Brown University that I had the good fortune to work with earlier in my career uh he actually was a fan of APL and he used it in some of his books at least some of his earlier books later books use MATLAB now there is a version of this language called J J programming language and the J language is basically APL, but without the crazy weird character set. Now, the reason I mentioned this is that it looks to me like there's some APL slash J influence on SuperCollider, because what the default is, is to try to take this array that's not long enough and to internally replicate it for you. So it's basically, you know, copying this as many times as it needs to get things to match up. So I think I can do the same notation like this. Uh, will this work? Let's see, it's evaluating left to right. I think this will. Uh, no, that doesn't do what I want. What if I do this? Uh, okay, there's a trickier. So what this is doing is it's taking this array one zero and it's making a link 16 array. It's not really what I want here. Essentially, there, I'm sure there's a command to do that. What it's really doing here is it's taking that one zero and it's copying it as many times as it needs to match up. So when I do something like that here, ah, this isn't doing what I want. Oh, you know what? That's the add command. Let me do this separately. So I'm just going to evaluate this separately like this. There we go. That's giving me what I want. It's taking this one zero inside the array with just one array still. It's taking one zero, one zero, one zero. So I get this pattern. Now notice the version here of my square compatible triangle. What I did is I don't want I don't want all the Fourier series coefficients to have the same sign. I want it to flip sign, so I do this. And now I get the sign flip because it's taking this one zero minus one zero pattern and copying it as much as it needs to. All right, uh, what did I break here? Oh, it didn't like, looks like I accidentally some, put something in there. All right, so this creates this little set of 4A series coefficients that I can experiment with. Now, this is just an array of coefficients. What I want to do is actually want to fill a lookup table. Now, there's a couple of different ways to do wave lookup tables like this inside of Super Collider, one of them sort of assumes that you're going to use it like a wave PPG or a sequential profit VS where you're just reading the values at. And if you want a sine wave out, you actually need to take sine wave values and stick it in the wave table. Here I'm using it specifically to take these Fourier series coefficients, not Fourier series coefficients, sorry. I'm taking these coefficients that I'm multiplying by these Chebyshev polynomials to create these wave functions. Like to get the first three harmonics that I'm calling the Jemmy Smith here, this one, one, minus one. And actually, I'm, this is a little interesting. So th this is probably worth a whole other YouTube video. Again, you're not going to be able to hear the difference if it's just a static waveform, but this, but the signs you put on these things will make a difference if you're using FM or if you're 
you know, if you're changing the amplitude going in. <sighs> Ooh, sorry, it's now 6.38 a.m. I'm just that dedicated to your education that while I'm on a roll, I'm still doing this. All right. Actually, let's play with this a second. I'm going to make a Jimmy Smith um, all positive where I'm going to set these positive and we can just look at what these different look at what these look like so if I set this one to the Jimmy Smith all positive versus the down here the Jimmy Smith like this you can see one of the reasons I I chose that particular configuration the waveform coming out and uh, actually let me do this with the initial patch so I'll say Jimmy Smith all positive and down here I'll say Jimmy Smith like this so here I'm using this crossfade knob I made to just artificially crossfade between the outputs of wave uh, wave shapers A and B. Notice there's a slight volume difference because of the way it normalizes things, but. The timbre is the same. So if we look at the wave tables, you'll see when I kept all the Fourier series, not, sorry, sorry, not Fourier series. Well, there's a resulting Fourier series. Okay, so the series of Chebyshev coefficients, when I'm multiplying the various Chebyshev coefficients by, will correspond to the Fourier series of the output if I put in a unit amplitude sinusoid. So that's the first three harmonics, harmonics one, two, and three, corresponding with the first three draw bars on a Hammond organ. Notice when I had them all be the same, I really don't get a whole lot out until I'm at this pretty far extreme. So if I change the index going in, uh, sorry, wrong one. It's pretty quiet until I hit the end here. Whereas when I look at the output of this one where I put minus one for that third harmonic, notice it fades in sooner. And as I crossfade between them, listen to the way it changes. You'll, you'll hear the fact that that third harmonic cancels along the way. So here you can hear the third harmonic. Actually, let me just play one note here. But if I balance these right, you only hear the first two harmonics. Hear that third? Hear that third? Here you don't hear the third. Because when I'm mixing those together, that third harmonic's canceling out. So I just like the way this looked better. It looked like, uh, you know, if I put in a sine wave here, that's kind of a waveform that's kind of using up more of the dynamic range than this one where I've got this big spike here. Anyway, I, Chebyshev polynomials and the way I'm choosing these coefficients deserves its whole deserves a whole video on its own. Anyway, after I set up these coefficients, I've got this thing called Chebyfill. Now, what's this doing? Well, I have a class called Signal. And one of its, um, I forget what the name are, the static methods. What are the methods that's not associated with the instance of the object? It, it just belongs to the whole class. It's kind of like a regular function. I'm going to make one that's 4096 length long. And I forget what the rest of this does here. Um, oh, I know what it is. This is actually setting a default wave shape. I don't know if I actually use that anywhere in the code now. So this is a Chebyshev... Uh, this is creating a signal using Chebyshev, Siri, Chebyshev coefficients where only you've only got the first one that's one. So this one is, um, what is this one doing? So this one is just creating that straight line. Now, I need to turn it into a signal that can be used as part of a lookup table. And that's where, that's why I have this as wavetable no wrap. Because a wavetable that you're using as just kind of a scanned wavetable, like if you just have a sinusoid, just literally all the values, or something like you would have in a wave PBG or Profit VS, you want to set this up so it can wrap around. 
But here you don't. You want it to top out here. So that's why I'm using this as wavetable no wrap method. Now, let's see. The last thing I'm doing on this default buffer, which again, I don't think I use anywhere now, but, but later it's this is the same structure I use when I am actually using these default series coefficients. I use this load collection that takes that wavetable of values. So this takes the Fourier series, sorry, it takes the Chebyshev polynomial coefficients, adds them all, adds them all up, creates an appropriate function like you see here, and stores it in one of these wavetables. So that's what you're seeing here. But to make it part of your synthesizer, you have to load this into a buffer that's actually used by the synth engine to actually use this in doing synthesis. Whew, that was a lot of stuff. So I think here, what I should probably do is, this is already pretty long. Let's stop here. That was a lot of setup stuff. And in the next video, I'll edit this together. And by edit together, I mean, I'll just throw together the various places where I stopped to look up a website or something. And we'll post this as a part one, and then we'll go through at least some of the rest of this code as a part two. But especially if you're new to Super Collider, that will probably keep you busy for now. So the main thing I want to talk about next time is the synth def and the server client architecture of Super Collider. So basically the server is a program that runs that actually does the sound synthesis. The client is a program that runs that tells the server what sound to synthesize. And there's a lot of stuff that you can do on the client side that you cannot do on the server side. So the synth def, where we're actually creating the synth, it's the real core of the synth. This is something that doesn't have access to a lot of the features you'll see in the Super Collider documentation, because a lot of things you'll find that look really cool that would make your coding life a lot easier in the Super Collider documentation don't exist on the server side. Once you understand more about the internals of Super Collider, it makes sense as to why, but it can be really frustrating when you're first starting out. So we'll start there next time. Hopefully this will entertain you in the meantime.